Welcome to the Gary Neville podcast, which we're doing today in the uh, bathing glory of these uh, Spurs fans celebrating an incredible finale in the match against uh, Liverpool. In the emotion of the aftermath, uh, Gary, what do you feel about that game? I've gone soft, Rob. <laughs> Why do I feel sorry for Liverpool Football Club? I should be, I should be dancing in the air with the Tottenham fans singing about Big Ange, but... It's uh, a first you, for everything. Yeah, they're just a professional side to you when you realise, you know, what obviously Matic will be going through now in the dressing room. I had to think what Jota will be going through in the dressing room and Curtis Jones. I've been sent off, not here, but the old White Hart Lane, when I was hoping my teammates would win and they drew 2-2. Tottenham came back many, many years ago. I got sent off for a second booking on David Janela. And when that goal goes and at the end, Curtis Jones and Jota in the dressing room will be like, they'll be devastated. Matic will be devastated. And they've given so much, Liverpool. They really look rock solid, they were resilient. Everything you would want in a football team. We're really quick to look at a team sometimes and say they're not putting it in. I mean, you don't, you never say that about Jurgen Klopp's teams, but you know, just generally, if we see that type of thing, that was the absolute opposite from Liverpool's players today. They've run their socks into the ground. Is that, is that a saying even? They've <laughs> run just, their socks off. You've just made <laughs> yeah. it one. And they've run themselves into the ground even. Um, yeah, it, honestly, Jurgen Klopp's substitutions, the way in which they defended, um, the way in which they managed the game, they look experienced. I've been critical of that Liverpool back line at times in this last 12 months for, for a team so experienced to concede goals, but actually they've only conceded five goals before this game. And obviously the big incidents in the game were the actual sendings off, but that's my immediate feeling after the game. Brilliant for Spurs, I think. You know, the manager will look at sort of how they play against maybe um, 10 men, nine men in the future, because I think there were some things that were wrong from a point of view of how to play, where to play on the pitch when you're playing against and how to stretch the game, um, the tempo of your passing, um, the spacing in your passing. Th these things are really important. We, we, I think at United were pretty good at it when I play. We had a way of playing against 10 men and nine men. As, admittedly, it's difficult because you've got obviously you know, backs to the wall type defensive thing, but they could have done a lot better Spurs and they'd run out of ideas. They'd literally run out of ideas. Let's talk about the red cards then, because the Curtis Jones one in particular, I think you see differently probably as a, an ex-pro to how a referee would yeah. look at it in the black and white of the law. Look, it's one of those, the more you look at it, the more you look at it, the more you look at it, you'll think, particularly in slow motion, it's a leg breaker. My instinct at the beginning is still my instinct now, and we've spoken to a couple more pundits at half-time, both of them defenders, actually. I'm not going to name them because I don't want to throw under the bus with me. Um, but they both think they can see what, exactly what Curtis Jones was trying to do. That was not a lunge over the ball to break a player's leg. That was a movement towards the ball to try and sort of step over it to control it. And his foot's just slide it, slid over the top of the ball, which is greasy. And basically, it then looks like he's throwing it forward because it's actually just gone into... Um, I mean, Pesuma, was it? Sorry, I don't, was it Pesuma? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was Pesuma, yeah. Um, so... Uh, for me, not a red card. There'll be those who will swear that I'm wrong till they're blue in the, I'm blue in the face, that I'm wrong and it's stupid and how can you not tell that's a red card? But I, honestly, from a professional perspective, I know when a player... There, there were some elbows out there today, by the way. I'm not going to name them, where players were looking to do the other players. I've been there. When you do that into someone's side of the face, you know you're doing that. That's not just like if you're like leveraging to go up for a ball. There are those as well, but this, there were some definitely nasty little ne elbows out there. That wasn't a nasty one from Curtis Jones. It ended up looking that way, but it wasn't a red card for me, and I'm not going to change my mind on that. And probably there'll be 50-50 or maybe 70-30 against me that think it was a red card, but no, not from a professional perspective of understanding what I think Curtis Jones was trying to do. What about Diogo Jota? Because that one obviously couldn't be overturned by VAR because it was two yellows. Do you think he was a bit unlucky with the first one and a bit rash maybe with the second? Yeah, unlucky with the first one, but he had had that challenge, I think, five minutes before. It was almost like he was asking to be booked. I know Liverpool were desperate. They were trying to break up the play and sometimes you take a yellow card. But I thought Jota was just... He lacked a little bit of composure because I think you could argue that the first yellow card was a result of the one that he could have got booked for before that. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There was one at the edge of the box just on that far side, wasn't there? I thought, you're lucky there, really. So he unnecessarily draws the referee's attention yeah. to him. And then there's yeah. a second instant just after it, and I think that's where then obviously the referee thinks, well, I'm just going to give you a yellow card. And then to do the second one was, that was stupidity. Jurgen Klopp actually didn't even look at him. He just went and sat on the bench and said, what do we do here? Um, and I don't, know, I don't think he had any sympathy for him at all. He knew that one was a bad one from Jotter. He made a bad mistake there. 
What about, uh, I mean, you mentioned that Spurs didn't really have the right formula to, to break through, and you said you worked on uh, playing against 10, playing against 9 at, uh, when you were at Man United. What do you think they could have done better? What, what should they have done to, to break through earlier than they did? Well, we know Spurs play with their full-backs narrow. We know that, and it works for them, and they're trying to obviously sort of, you know, design a game through that. And then they have the two wide players wide. I thought there were times in that last 15, 20 minutes where the wide players narrowed in because Liverpool were narrow, so they almost, if you like, just follow the Liverpool wing-back stroke, full-backs in. That was the first thing. And then when they got the ball wide, they actually just ran in towards them and they were waiting there, you know, packed in the sort of line of five, rather than just saying, like, come on, you draw out, you come out and close me down and get some play and try and draw them out a little bit to a side to stretch the whole team. And then you might switch it quickly back into the middle. The other thing is the, the full-backs, I would have said, go to a more traditional system. Don't go in there to actually play. Go wide with your wingers and then really stretch that three in midfield. So Liverpool have a five and they have a three. So the two in there, let's say it's a doggy and Porro, you stretch yourselves wide. So you've almost got two wide on each side, which is not what Tottenham do, I know, but that should have definitely happened. That's how we used to do it. And then what you're doing then is stretching the pitch to its absolute maximum and you're swinging the Liverpool players from side to side and you're wearing the legs. But you're also hoping that you draw them over to one side, they come over, you have a bit of play over this side, might be for 10, 15 seconds, but then you pop it back in and all of a sudden you've either got the switch to the other side, which means you can get a one-on-one -on -one quickly, or you can go through the middle. So for me, they weren't working those positions and situations hard enough. Um, I think that they should have gone to a more traditional full-back position as an attacker and gone wider. The wide players should have been more patient. And then when they got it in wide areas, actually stay on the ball a little bit in wide areas longer so that then they could push it back in. What they ended up doing was just feeding that Liverpool sort of, if you like, defence that were like this. They were like a claw, and they were just inside the claw, the, the, the Tottenham players. You know, Kulisevsky was relatively dangerous still, but they were almost in some ways just lured in by Liverpool's system and they just sort of just stretched the game and got like that and they didn't do that. And for me, that was the biggest thing that I saw. Ange Postecoglou may see it completely differently, but that's how high would traditionally have always played against 10 men or 9 men if that was the occasion in the game. Not I, but the, the, the teams I played in. But Spurs did make the breakthrough. They've uh, done it before this season, late on against uh, Sheffield United. Are they, is this the kind of character mentality that makes them actually look serious title contenders this season? Yeah, no, I don't think the title contenders. I think when you see the bench coming on at the end, you know they're not title contenders. I think they'll be way off that. Uh, but what they are is spirited. They're more resilient than I imagined they would be. And I think I say that not really more out of today's game. I say it more out of the North London derby last week and what I saw. I've seen th uh, Spurs in three big games this season. The Manchester United game here, where, to be fair, most teams are beating United at the moment, but they still had to go and do it. Tottenham last, uh, Arsenal last week, really good. Really impressed. Impressed by their courage to play, obviously, their patterns of play. Um, impressed with them today, less so in the last 20 minutes, but that wasn't a resilience element. That was more of actually, to be fair, on the ball, finding a way to score a goal. But they're in a good place and there's a spirit in the stadium. There is a spirit on the pitch. There is a connection between, I think, the way this manager is, the, the players on the pitch and actually, to be fair, the people in the crowd and we're not talking too much about the boardroom at Spurs as much as we would have been obviously in the last few years you know the, I mentioned at the start of the game there was a period in the first 10-15 minutes of the game it was a really good game you know you know until Curtis Jones got sent off I don't know what minute it was 20 odd minutes it was a really good game the quality of the play was fantastic it really was it's the best I've seen Liverpool Spurs since Klopp v Pochettino and I mentioned that on commentary and they were brilliant games that was Spurs as I would expect a good Spurs to be front foot yeah, they're still getting some punches off Liverpool on the counter-attack and certainly Liverpool are dangerous. But I just thought it was a really brilliant game. And I, I, it was a shame. It was a shame that the game went to what it did. But there's no doubt there's something happening here for Spurs. It isn't always as good as it looks. And I think there'll be challenges down the line. But I think they'll have a better season than I thought they would. And are Liverpool back? Because, of course, Jurgen Klopp got to that tipping point in the summer where he almost knew it had to be the players who were moving or him. He's reinvented the team a little bit. What do you make of the new Liverpool? They've definitely got a spirit. They've definitely got a fight. We know that. And, you know, ultimately, the Jurgen Klopp's teams always do. Um, I don't think, I don't think they'll challenge for the title, is my honest opinion. Um, I think that their midfield is better and 
it's settled in quicker than I thought they would. But I still think there'll be some challenges that they haven't got a true holding player. Um, but I think they're in a pretty decent place. And Jurgen Klopp might not challenge for the title this season. But I think another transfer window or two. And he may just have something quite special. If Nunez, Diaz, Salah, obviously we know, Jota, Gakpo, Gravenberg we saw come on. If those players can start to sort of build something this season, they may be in a place next season where they can challenge again with one or two more additions. They aren't far away uh, and the goalkeeper's outstanding and obviously I think the back four even look better today. So from that point of view, I think he'll be, I think he'll be in a good place, Jurgen Klopp, from where he was obviously earlier on in the transfer window when he was wondering what was going to happen and there was a little bit of dismay amongst Liverpool fans that they wouldn't get that, those midfield players that they needed. Even before the match and uh, before the red cards and everything else that happened, he, he will probably regard this as having been a missed opportunity because, of course, we had that rarest of things this weekend, uh, a Manchester City defeat. And I'm sure you, you wouldn't have seen that coming at Wolves. No. No, I mean, I've got Arsenal to win the league this year and um, just that post-treble feeling, that post-treble sort of like... I mean, th what it will have taken out of those City players and coaching staff will be enormous and they could easily go and win the league this season and obviously it's one game but little things like that do give other clubs encouragement and it is early we know that City have lost games in the past and they've gone on big big long runs so you know let's not sort of start if you like writing them off by any stretch of the imagination but I think that will give a bit of encouragement a lot of encouragement to Arsenal I think obviously what happened in the week against Newcastle um, it was a serious team that Pep Guardiola took up there and I think today at Wolves we haven't seen it yet but they're conceding goal or two which again they're going behind in games they look human um, and it'll be interesting it'll be interesting I still think Arsenal if they can keep their players fit have got a great chance this season I really do I think they've got a great chance and Arsenal, who you mentioned as uh, your favourites yeah. for the title uh, this year, pressed on regardless with that 4-0 win at, uh, at yeah. Bournemouth. Um, another goal for Saka and uh, a goal for Havertz, admittedly from the penalty spot, but uh, he's opened his account now. Yeah, and it's important that they get him playing. Um, he's a major signing for them and they can't continue to keep having a cloud over him about what his best position is. Is he going to be on the bench? Why is he not playing well? Is he going to score a goal? I mean, to be fair, there's a couple of times I've seen them live this season where he's looked very awkward in front of goal. So I think that'll be important for him. Don't know what happened with that. We've not seen the game, have we? But we know there's two different penalty scorers, don't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Erdegaard scored one as well. Yeah, so it's quite strange um, that that's happened. We don't know why it's happened. Maybe we'll obviously find out later on. But you know, a good response from Arsenal. Obviously, you expect them to win the game. Last week, they'll have come out of that North London derby disappointed um, that they haven't won. But I think they'll also understand why they didn't win. There's things in that game that were challenging for them, losing Declan Rice. And um, that was something that ultimately, I think, losing Trossard, losing Martinelli, obviously, before the game, they're left wingers. So things like that did go against them. But they'll face those moments in the season. Uh, but it's very early, very early. They're jostling for positions. They're still at the very, uh, if you like, start of the race. But I think they'll be confident in our Arsenal that they're back in there. They're not sort of that, that gap isn't going from sort of four points to six. And then you start to think, well, are we, are we ever going to catch this lot? Are they one point off them? Uh, I've not seen the updated table, check. to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Yeah. Um, we'll just do an updated table for you. Just one yeah, second. one point. Yeah, yeah one mm -hmm. point off them. So, yeah. you know, that's a good place to be. You know, on the shoulder. Um, stay with them. Stay with them. Stay with them. Get to that point where you're nine, ten games to go again. You're not going to go, you're not going to run away and win the league. You, honestly, your first league's very rarely going to be like that. You're going to have to get over the line crawling. And last season, they obviously, to be fair, fell apart with nine, ten games to go, made big mistakes. They've got to get in, themselves into that position again and then we'll see whether they've matured and they've experienced. And I think there probably will be. I'd like to see a little bit more just composure and ruthlessness in Arsenal in moments in games. I've not seen the game today and they obviously have won 4-0. But there's, there's big big tests to come and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens because I don't think it'll all be Manchester City this season. Spurs fans would want me to point out they're also a point behind them, by the way. Well done, Spurs. <laughs> um, I won't labour the point about Manchester United, but, I mean, what is it where they, they take a step forward and then today take another step back? Honestly, I mean, I w on Tuesday night, my Tuesday night went something like, I started watching the Salford game on the link, the game against Burnley, and after 10 minutes we were 2-0 down. I thought, do you know, I'm going to watch United play in the Carabao Cup. And I did. I watched the game. And I wasn't expecting to like it, to be honest with you, with what I've seen this season. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the performance from United. You know, Hannibal, 
um, Palestri, Ganacho played. Um, Amrabat in midfield with Casemiro looked like it was something, but it was a real energy. There was some sprinting back from the wide players. You know, the back players played really well. And I thought, yeah, I could, I, I, that's a likeable performance. That's something I can live with. I actually tweeted out at half-time, this is the best performance of the season. And I was really encouraged, not by the fact that obviously Crystal Palace left players out, the fact that it's a Carabao Cup, the fact that obviously people will say it's not the most important. I get all that. But where you've been as Manchester United this season, which is for some pretty awful performances, is the first performance I'd seen without mood. And I can't pinpoint what mood looks like, but I nearly tweeted on Wednesday morning, but I thought, no, have an enjoyable week. I don't want to start a riot on my timeline on Wednesday morning. I nearly tweeted out, that's the first time I've seen Manchester United play this season without mood. It was fresh. It was likeable. There was an energy to it. There were patterns of play in the game that I thought, that looks something like a team. Yeah, that, that reflects a bit of work on the training ground and a bit of sort of pattern and a bit of rep repetition. I haven't seen the game today. They may have been absolutely amazing and lost 1-0. But it doesn't surprise me that this has happened today against the same, obviously, club, Crystal Palace, different team. It doesn't surprise me one bit. Um, and can't put my finger on it yet until obviously I see the highlights or I watch the game back. But honestly... I, I I didn't tweet out on Wednesday, I wish I had, because that's what I was feeling, um, that I thought, you know, they'll come and bring some players back on Saturday and we'll be back to the normal again. And that's what they've got. They've, they've lost at home and they're having a really poor run, a really poor run. Um, and I don't think it'll be right for quite some time. I don't think it'll, I'm not going to go on about the owners again because people are bored of it, but it'll go on for quite some time because there is a cultural reset required at the club okay let's let's just highlight two more uh weekend performances uh villa's yeah. six win uh, six one win over brighton and and luton getting their first premier league win they're, they're the first yeah. of the promoted clubs to to get one this season well when we saw that two nil luton I, I imagine being you thinking you know we know goodison park i imagine goodison park today it would have been toxic um but well done luton well well done luton you know we've written them off already we wrote Bournemouth off last year we've written all the teams that have come up off we all have we all thought there yeah, them three could go down definitely but you need a result like that just sometimes and Luton have got a spirit of course they've got a spirit they're fighting for their lives they're in the time of their lives uh, and it's a brilliant result and we've not seen it as you say but absolutely fantastic and delighted for them we went there a few Fridays ago and it didn't quite work out for them they got beat but you know generally I think that you know it'd be great to see Luton sort of put up a yeah, put up a real scrap. It'd be wonderful to see them stay up. It really would be great to see them stay up. And even Sheffield United, Burnley, it'd be great to see them and sort of like, you know, upset the apple cart because that's what we're, that's where we're at. We're all thinking they're in trouble. But um, yeah, Everton have done okay in the last week or so, but, you know, back to normal for them. Uh, inconsistent. Uh, and for, for Luton, brilliant. And for Aston Villa, I really like them. Love the manager. Really like uh, Aston Villa. I think that he gets the maximum out of them. You can't, they can get whack Brighton, can't they, sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> Come back next week and beat, like, I don't know, Man City 3 0 or something, or do something stupid. But, you know, the Brighton are a bit like that. The way they play, they can sort of sometimes get a little bit of a, um, a doing. And uh, um, Yeah, they had their bloody nose against Everton, didn't they? The yeah. back end of last season yeah, at home. Was it four? Was it four? four nil? Five, it was five yeah. End, wasn't it? yeah. Yeah, and I think that um, Villa, I, I predicted at the start of the season, I thought they'd do well. I think the signings were good. Um, and I think that the manager's good and I think they've got good patterns of play uh, and challenges obviously with Europe and other things but I think, I think they'll have a good season I think that he knows what to do uh, Unai Emery he navigates playing in Europe and in the Premier League very well he's done it for many, many years So finally Gary looking ahead to uh, next weekend with the way the results have gone this uh, weekend with now just the one point between them how are you viewing that huge Arsenal-Manchester City clash that they'll be uh, live on Sky Sports? interesting what I want to see from Arsenal is maturity in the game I don't want to see like a boxer coming out throwing loads of punches and looking really excited I want to see a maturity in the game I want to see them build a performance that's got might in it and it's got strength in it and it's clinical and it I want to see them put in a championship performance we know they can play exhilarating football we know they can play a lot of wonderful combinations we know they can get emotional and passionate about the game but what I want to see is a maturity where they look at Manchester City and they don't get overawed by the occasion. They don't let things affect them. They stick to their job. They show composure in the game. 
through their passing and their build-up and sort of their also the defensive work. I want to see something that tells me that there is a development in the squad that will mean that you can say, right, OK, this is something that you can hang on. That's a long way to go to be anywhere near title winners, but put a performance in that tells Manchester City that this is a different team. You remember Manchester City playing in that game, sort of seven or eight games to go at the, at the Etihad, where they absolutely just beat them up and they look like little boys, Arsenal. That hasn't got to happen next week. And, you know, City will come there and they'll want to try and leave a mark on Arsenal and leave a scar as well. Not just a mark, a scar that sort of lasts in the heads and men mentally. You've got to somehow switch that sort of mentality from one that thinks that, you know, yeah, they are better than us, they've won the treble, oh, and they're better than us again because they're going to beat us next week. Uh, they've got to come away from there, Manchester City, if you're Arsenal, thinking that was a bit different, that was a bit stronger, that was a bit more sort of serious, and I think that's what Arsenal have got to do next week. Should be a great weekend. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Thank Thanks, you. Gary. Thank you.